This week on Kentucky Field, spring is here, and if you're a hunter, then you know what that means. It's turkey season. We had a great opening day hunt that you've got to see. Next, another great spring tradition in the bluegrass. Oh, here we go. This, this might be a little better one here. We're walking the banks and catching white bass on the Salt River. Now this is a bait fish eating machine right here. Then, we aren't the only ones that are getting out and being more active. Find out what you need to know to be bear aware. It's all next on Kentucky Field. Such a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plumb loaded with frogs. They're everywhere in here. Yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! <laughs> My first musket. <laughs> Here it goes! Boom! Oh. 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 Wow, that happened fast. Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. The 2019 spring turkey season came with great weather, and it brought tons of excitement. But to be successful, sometimes the name of the game is patience. We've made it to the ridge top of this place we're hunting. We're kind of in the knobs of Nelson County. We're gonna sit down here and try to find out where these turkeys are at. We scouted this place a little bit a couple weeks ago. And right where we're sitting, there was a bunch of turkey scratchings and droppings, but I had no idea where they're roosting. But hopefully, we'll get some action here in a minute. Deer, right here. Coming right at us. set out and we're in a location where any turkey that comes into this field should be able to see this decoy. We have not heard a gobble yet this morning but we know there are turkeys here. This is about the time of day they normally start separating out again and that gives you the best chance of calling one in. Got a turkey straight across the field, probably 150 yards. Here comes another one. We got two turkeys. These look like Jake's. They're coming straight out in the field right here. Here comes another one. A third turkey just came into the field. I think we've got three Jake's. We've got one on the left and we've got two on the right. They're making their way across this field. I know they're gonna come over here. another turkey. Looks to me like we've got three jakes in a hand. Here they come right here, coming right at us. I've got two jakes in range right now. Let's let this play out and see what happens. They're curious. Come around. Here they come. 
Um, they're coming right to us. I mean, right to us. We've got a turkey right in front of us and a turkey about 10 yards behind us, staring us down, or actually in between the turkeys and the decoy. Man, we were locked down. We had two jigs, decided to pass. But that's awesome, that's why you come out. The close encounters are super, super exciting. There's a coyote all the way in the far corner. Coming out there in the field right there. Watching wildlife's always fun. But when you're on a turkey hunt and a coyote shows up, it's not necessarily a good thing. That coyote just caught something, a mouse or something. And he's eating it right now. Not paying much attention to our decoys. I think it's because he's got a full belly. So we hunted here this morning and we saw some jakes and never heard a gobble. We had a game plan set for this afternoon hunt. It was walking in. And before I enter any field, I'll make sure I scan it as good as I can. Up there in the corner, through a tree, I see a black dot, and we start looking at it, and it goes into full strut. We got our decoy set up, backed off. We're gonna try to call this turkey in. It's probably about 250 yards right now. We got this gobbler to sound off. First gobble we've heard yet. Hopefully we can get it to come to us. Problem is, a hen has popped out on the other side of the field. So we got a little competition from the real thing. We gotta hope our decoy and our calling sounds a little better than that hen right there. There he goes again. crazy, but I really don't think he's interested in that hen. He's paying more attention to us. That turkey's coming our way, but he just went in the woods. Here he is, here he is, right here. Now he's coming to the right, he's up there, he's about a hundred out right now. Here he comes, he's coming down the hill. He's gonna come to us. Wow, this was, this was the craziest hunt. It took more patience than maybe any turkey hunt I've been on. Let's go see what we got. There he is. Oh my God. I tell you what, beautiful bird. Got a big thick beard on it. Some pretty impressive hooks on it too. Such an awesome hunt. Really, really excited to be able to get this bird because this was a solid three hours of watching this bird work. And lo and behold, he wasn't coming through this field. This bird decided it was gonna come in and sneak in and get a better look at that Jake decoy 
through the woods, and that's exactly what he did. Today we're with Zach Couch, the at-risk species biologist here at the Department of Fish and Wildlife. What'd you bring here with us? Today we've got a uh, northern slimy salamander. Are these pretty common here in the state of Kentucky? They are. They're uh, probably one of our more common salamanders that we have in the state as long as you're east of uh, Barkley Lake. I've seen quite a few lures exactly like this. I'm assuming fish eat these? Well, this is actually a completely terrestrial species. Okay. It never gets either as a egg, larvae, or adult. It never comes in contact with the water. It's found a lot of times under rotten logs or uh, some real wet leaves, stuff okay. like that out in the woods. So tell me something interesting about this particular species. Well, it's called a slimy salamander for a reason. It exudes this uh, stuff, and you can see it on my hand here, it kind of sticks to your hand, oh, and yeah. it's, a, it's a predator defense. So if something tries to eat it, this thing kind of gums it up. Essentially, it's not really very palatable, and okay. most of the time, whatever's trying to eat it will spit it out. We also have lizards here in the state of Kentucky. What's the mm -hmm. difference between a salamander and a lizard? Well, the easiest way to do it is look at its skin. If it's a uh, real shiny, slick skin like this, it needs to stay wet. Uh, okay. It's a salamander. If it's got scales, then it's a lizard. Okay. Uh, and, you know, and sometimes you got salamanders and lizards in, in the same area, so you really mm -hmm. got to kind of look at one to tell what it is, right. right? Yeah, salamanders, just from the fact that they've got that real slick skin on them, you know, they, you'll usually find those in wetter areas, whereas okay. a uh, lizard will be more in a dry upland area. Okay. Is this a good indicator for overall health of the environment if you have good salamander populations? Yep, absolutely. Uh, salamanders are pretty intolerant to uh, a lot of disturbance, so if you have a good mature forest that's uh, got a lot of leaf litter underneath of it, some mm -hmm. old dead decaying logs, you'll find you an abundance of salamanders. All right, fantastic. Well, thanks for bringing it out and uh, showing it to us today. Absolutely, happy to. There are many ways to catch the white bass on their spring spawn runs here in Kentucky. The key is timing. white bass are running, let's walk down here to the Salt River and see if anyone's having any luck. You got a black crappie on there, some white bass. Where are you from? Marksburg. Marksburg. What's your name? James Whitehouse. James Whitehouse. So I'll tell you what, there's nothing like getting down here in the spring and just walking the banks because it is the best time of year to get out and fish. You're throwing a little pink Popeye, and that's how you're it's catching them. It's last two days, I don't think it's hit. It's really amazing, because people have their techniques and the way they like to catch them, but you're catching them up, you're probably dr drifting about two feet below or three feet, something like that. So have you seen quite a few other people do here fishing lately? Well, the, the yesterday, a bunch of people. One guy stood right there, the pink Popeye, he called about, they were third or fourth cast. So how many years have you been coming down here and fishing? Ever since you've been in here. So you, you're originally from Lawrenceburg? Yeah. No, I'm written Boyle County. So now Boyle County, the Dix River also yeah. has white yeah, bass. I'm up here too. Okay. So you've traveled the state catching these yeah. these early early I'm fish. I caught a war these <laughs> Well, I really do appreciate your time. Thank you and good luck. That's a heck of a stringer you got. Saw guy. That guy's been telling us he wanted to catch one. He just figured it out. Here we go. Little male. And I'll tell you, I made about 10 casts right here. I was letting it bounce the bottom and every now and then getting hung up, so I decided to speed the retrieve up. Now these fish, when they're ready to feed, can be really aggressive. We'll see if that holds true. I'll cast out a little further and burn it a little faster back in. Here we go. I'll tell you right now, these fish are wanting this bait aggressive. And if I can get it out there, it's really, really hard because, you know, we're fishing early, early, early year conditions. But we gotta understand, these are fish that like the cold weather. They really want this bait fast today. What is that? Oh, we caught him a saw guy. Look at that. You know, you never know what you're gonna catch come out here. See a guy with a stringer full of crappie. We've seen a guy with a stringer full of white bass. And now look at that, saw guy. Those are good ones too. You can't beat that. Oh man, I'm happy. Oh, here we go. This, this might be a little better one here. Now I don't know what we've got, but this is not a white bass. Whatever we've got is not happy to be hooked. 
This is a white bass. Now, now. At first glance, I thought this was a white bass, but this is actually a hybrid. These fish are all moving up here kind of at the same time. Boy, that's a lot of fun. Taylor's Lake has a bunch of hybrids, and they were put in here by the department many years ago to deal with the amount of bait uh, the fish that are in this, in this lake. And uh, this is a bait fish eating machine right here. I have got me a little honey hole all of a sudden. It's all about finding the pace and the speed that they want it. This is the third or fourth one I've caught this size. And what this is, is this is a male white bass. White bass, like a lot of other fish species, what they'll do is the males will show up first. So these males will run up this river stream, and when you start catching the smaller ones, typically you either need to go toward the main lake, try to catch the females, or fish that same spot in a few days after a hard rain, the bigger fish will show up. This is, uh, this is definitely a male white bass. This is the greatest thing about fishing in this river. You've got so much walk-in access. There's a boat ramp, you can run a boat right up in here. Or this might be the easiest and best way right here. You just jump in a kayak. They can t pull that thing up anywhere on the bank that they want and catch a fish. It's a great way to go about it. You guys had your luck? Uh, I caught a little flathead earlier, but oh, we really? literally just got in. We have been on the water maybe 10 minutes. A flathead? Yeah. Wow. Off the crank or off the dirt bait. Never know. Oh, here we go. Uh-oh, might have another hybrid. These species of fish fight like crazy. Now this is a white bass. Hey, they're getting a little bit bigger. And when you get out here and you fish this, sometimes, you know, people will swear on a certain color. And for me, you know, sometimes it does seem like certain colors may work better on certain days. I always tend to like white or this pearl color, and then I'll change up the head color. And for whatever reason, it seems like pink is what they're hitting today. There you go, he's got one down there. There we go. Same size fish. These are plenty big enough to clean and eat if you wanted to make a mess. To get that cast out there, you really need a rod and reel that will allow you to make long casts. This is a medium action with an extra fast tip, seven foot, four inches. And I sometimes even use a longer one. I'm throwing four to six pound test. I can't remember what's on there, but you really want to be able to rip real long cast. This bait here is only an eighth ounce. So making a cast right and get to the middle is really the most important part of this, is getting the, getting the bait out there where the fish are at. Spring is the time of year that the young male bears are on the move, and we always need to remember to be bear aware. John Hast, Bear Program Coordinator here for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about what all that entails. Uh, what that entails, a lot of times, uh, this point in the season, it's dealing with a lot of nuisance issues that our bears uh, that our bears cause. I don't know if their range is actually growing so much, but uh, you're, we're seeing them male bears at certain times of mm -hmm. year throughout parts of the state. About this time of the year, the young males start getting more or less bounced out of the the core of the bear range. When the older males come back in to breed, they'll bounce the yearling males out, and that's normally what we're seeing when we get a bear that that is up around central Kentucky, that's, it's 99% of the time a, a one-year-old male bear that's just looking for, mm -hmm. looking for food and looking to get out of the core of the bear range. Today we're kind of really focusing on bear aware. Mm -hmm. Definitely about, because we are getting the bears back into Kentucky, so we have to be bear aware in bear country. Mm -hmm. And so we set up a whole campsite as if you're visiting bear country and camping. And also we have like, if you're living in bear country, your backyard. So it's kind of to show what's good and what's not good to, to have out there. Black bear encounters in the state of Kentucky with humans is common, but we've never had a fatality, correct? Correct, yeah. But, but they are, they, they tend to be unpredictable at times. And a lot of that also comes back to, the, to uh, a bear that's is fine with approaching people. You might think that you can you know, have it approach you or you approach it to get some photos, 
or something like that, and that's always a bad idea. Well, the, the main thing we encounter is uh, bears getting in people's trash and pet food and around the houses is most of the nuisance problems we have. The main thing with a bear is a food source. If there's no food source, then you're not going to see a bear around your house. You'd be buying those plastic garbage cans every night if you have a bear coming by. They would get pretty expensive. Oh, yes, yes. And you can see how quickly he put his head in, got the food out. Even flattened it, so. No. Uh -oh. It's a repeat occurrence until people learn to live with the bears. The whole idea may seem pretty enticing to see a bear, but yep. man, it can really cause some problems, huh? Right. They're and fun. be dangerous. Yeah, they're fun the first day or two, but then once they get that food reward, it's hard to get them to leave. Yeah, look at that. Pretty simple. Yes. I thought it would take a little bit of time for him to get in that cooler, but uh, it no. flipped that thing over and was right in. Yeah, it's a very, it's a cheap cooler from Walmart that everyone has, and yeah, it was, very easy for him to get into. Yeah, the worst case scenario is uh, a bear that's been hand fed, a bear that associates a human with their garbage. And a lot of times we'll see those bears um, around tourist areas, state parks and such that end up being hand fed and become a problem. Um, and they'll approach people, they'll, we've had cases of people being run off their picnic table while the, while the lunch is spread out. And there's really nothing we can do as bear managers except catch and euthanize that bear. And it's, a, it's an unfortunate way for a bear to go, but it's due to their association with humans and food. If you call and say, the bear has gotten in my trash five nights in a row, what's that tell you you need to do? You need to uh, remove that food source. There's several ways to deal with the trash. Um, leave, leave it inside until trash day, and then put it out that morning. Uh, maybe purchase a bear-proof can. So John, what we have here is a, considered a bear-proof container. It is, yeah. So we talked about bears being smart. So a bear comes to here a couple times and gets nothing out of it, he's probably gonna quit visiting it or at least he's not gonna be strewing the garbage around, correct? Yeah, it's not worth his while to come and get it. And this is very typical of what you'll find in say Red River Gorge throughout the Daniel Boone National Forest. And then a lot of our state parks in bear country have gone to this type of dumpster. So this is just one example. There are other examples of uh, bear-proof con uh, garbage containers, correct? Yeah, there are. Um, these are available in larger sizes for commercial places, uh, gas stations, restaurants, stuff like that. And we encourage our, uh, our uh, store owners in Eastern Kentucky, if they have a bear problem, to think about getting a commercial dumpster. So obviously, if you're a homeowner, this may be a little bit more expensive, but there are other options you can come up with as well. And it can become illegal feed, feeding yeah. bears in, uh, in and around your house, correct? It is. The, the law states that you cannot directly or indirectly feed a bear. Mm -hmm. And what that means is, of course, directly feeding is you intentionally feed. Mm -hmm. Indirect means that, say a bear is getting in your trash or your pet food mm -hmm. and you keep, just keep putting it out mm -hmm. and you don't try to take measures to keep the bear from getting in it, or uh, you didn't mean to put the pet food out for the bear, but if it gets in it and you keep doing that, then that's kind of an, an indirect feeding. It ends up being a uh, little bit of a lifestyle change for the residents that live in the counties that have bears, and that, that area now is pretty much the majority of eastern Kentucky. When you get east and, and southeast of Lexington, you're in bear country, and it's best just to be aware take care of your garbage, don't give the bear reason to come around. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you'll still see a bear, but it won't become a problem. Mm -hmm. So we gotta, we gotta be concerned with pet food, mm -hmm. garbage, human food. Human food, bird feeders. Bird feeders. Mm -hmm. And then any kind of, if you've got um, goats and livestock, a lot of people have small hobby farms and those tend to be problems too with chicken feed and, and goat feed. Well, we hope everyone's safe. We want the bears to remain safe and uh, we want people outdoors enjoying, enjoying what we have to offer in the state of Kentucky and Eastern, in Eastern Kentucky especially. But we want people to handle their garbage and, and to do it res responsibly. Yes. So get outdoors and enjoy yourselves, but just take care of your trash and your food, right? That's, that's the main message, Yep, correct? it's the best way to live in bear country. So if you want to get up and close and personal with a bear, this is a pretty good place to do it, Slato Center, right? I mean, you're typically going to be 
you know, you, you're never going to be further than a couple hundred feet, but you're, a lot of times you're going to be within 10, 12, 15 feet, right? Oh, yes, yes. Definitely with the enrichments, he knows. He comes up, he's right there in front of the window, usually just a couple feet from the window to where you can get a good, safe look at the bears. Yeah, a lot better than getting that close out, out in the wild, obviously. We don't want to do that. Yes. If you're lucky enough to be a boat owner here in the state of Kentucky, you need to know that your registration expires on April the 30th. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water.